I'm really pleased to be here on My Magical Thing with Marcus McCoy of Troll Cunning Forge, sorceress smith of magical objects, with a practice influenced by folk magic and the alchemical tradition, author, conjurer of magical sense of the House of Orpheus and co-organiser of the Viridis Genii Symposium. Marcus, it's lovely to have you here. It's great to be here. Marcus McCoy, please may we see your magical thing. Yes. Ah. A very humble hammer. Tell us the story of your hammer, Marcus, please. So this is a uh, $10 hammer from Harbor Freight, uh, which is uh, in the United States. It's just a, a really cheap hardware store that is a chain of hardware stores. And this is a three pound hammer, um, short handle, which means that I, you know, on, on large objects, you know, I burn my knuckles quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it was cheap and just the right size and weight for doing the majority of the work that I do. Um, when I got it, uh, I liked the shape of it. And I also like the, just the, the profile of it. And so I took a grinder and uh, put texturing on it and just kind of made it my own. Um, polished it up a bit, got the black faces off of the sides so they, they enamel the sides of it and, and uh, just really made it my own. And I posted it on, on Instagram when I was done and people really liked it even though they knew it was just a harbor freight but it's the way that i dressed it and so i just i made a few and and passed them out to people you know that that really wanted them but like over the years you know i've had different people come and help and work in my forge and everybody just is like this is the best hammer you've got and i have really nice hammers that i've paid you know hundreds of dollars for made by other blacksmiths that are all you you know all ornate and every single one you know like there's different hammers for different jobs and uh, uh different purposes different things that you need to do with those hammers you know there there's cross peens and diagonal cross peens and um you know and you can texturing hammers i have so many hammers now it's ridiculous um but this is the workhorse like this is the one that i use the most and that everybody else reaches for as well and uh, I use it so much that when I switch over to another hammer, it feels like I'm on Mars or something. It's just it's it's such a it's such an odd feeling because I just use this so much. And um, I chose this because it's a really humble thing, you know, like a, a hammer. And hammers aren't necessarily, you know, of course, there's like associations with like maybe you know like. Ogun or uh, you know different blacksmithing gods or, or or you know Thor is the most common you know association, but for the most part, people when they're doing their magical practice, they don't think of like they think of maybe a, a knife or a sword, like an athame or a wand or. Um, uh, a staff, you know, a nice wizard staff or, you know, things like that. And I make those things. I make all those things, you know. Uh, and I also make, I've made hammers as well. But very few people think of, you know, a hammer as being a magical object. And I think that's really interesting. It's also very telling of our time and of people's, you know, presumptions about magic and, and, and things like that. And and it's interesting because I, uh, in my 20s, I really studied Northern Peruvian, uh, you know, I've got a degree in, in transpersonal anthropology and I studied and focused on uh, Northern Peruvian uh, uh, Huachumero uh, Coranderismo, which is the, the 
practice of imbibing San Pedro cactus and, you know, doing cleansings and sometimes sorcery and things like that uh, for people. And, you know, a lot of times people say it's a very shamanic practice and it isn't, it isn't. It's, it's more closely related to, to just European folk magic than, and uh, hardcore occultism in some time, you know, in some ways than anything else. But in like, you'll see in like different communities where, uh, these practitioners work, uh, whatever the main industry is, those tools get incorporated into the, the sorceress practices of the practitioner. And so in one particular uh, ethnography that I, I got a hold of, which was pretty hard to get a hold of, not a lot of people know about it. It's just called simply Wachumaro. Uh, and they really focused on this one particular curandero who uh, was living in a community of quarry workers people that worked in quarries and so a lot of the tools were quarryman's tools mm -hmm. and so his altar or mesa you know like it had all these these magical objects that were extremely powerful that he worked with uh and did all kinds of occult things with but he also worked with them in the quarry and i found that you know to me in my 20s when i read that you know i was like that's that's it right there that right that's some serious authenticity like that is so that's so important you know and that one of the things that really struck me was they had this long bar this giant pro like like uh steel pry bar for uh moving i mean you know, it was like eight feet long uh of like crowbar basically that you use for for moving uh, large boulders and things around and, you know, prying rocks with maybe several people, you know, or a pivot point. And uh, you could immediately, like, in your, in the way you do magic within that tradition, you can immediately see the magical value of that tool mm. being used to, like, remove a large obstacle uh from someone's path like on a spiritual level you know like uh that to me i was just like that was really profound this mm -hmm. this very common tool that no one no one in the occult world today would like look at a, a an eight foot long steel pry bar used in a quarry is a very powerful magical object but that particular one in the way it was worked with which was just a common tool just like my hammer you know but that tool was extremely powerful because it could move great weights off of someone's shoulders or you know like burdens that were affecting them in their lives life situations causing like really great change that no ordinary you know no small crowbar could affect <laughs> <laughs> you know, it needed a big one. <laughs> and that was, to me, it was just like, that's really profound. That was, that was really profound. And that had a really big impact on me. Um, and so like, when you ask this question, I had to figure out what, what object, and I've got so many, I mean, I make them, you know, I make magical objects. And so I had to figure out like, well, like, I'm not going to bring my anvil up into my office. Um, but that's, that's one of the big, the big ones, you know, like, and I would have, I would have, you know, had it not been so unwieldy, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, just like, here you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the anvil is also like, it's like an altar. Um, it's also a tool. It, it, it works with the hammer, you know, you, you know, you need both of them. And, uh, I do lots of magic with that anvil. Uh, as well you know and I think people people definitely look at and fetishize anvils as somewhat of a magical thing you know mm -hmm. like the blacksmith is becoming more and more recognized as being you know traditionally seen as like a sorcerer um, and I've really tried to like push that and I know a few other blacksmiths have really tried to like emphasize the, the blacksmith's role as like sorcerer in traditional societies as well um, and also, I gotta say, uh, you know, solidarity with Ukrainians right now is that the, the the Ukrainian blacksmith traditions they 
they had a very solid uh, folk magic tradition of sorcery with their their blacksmiths and even today uh, the Ukrainian blacksmiths are some of the in the world of blacksmithing they're some of the blacksmiths that I respect the most in terms of the the skill of their art and their trade and so to recognize that that today that there's still some of the best blacksmiths in the world in my opinion uh and that they had such a strong you know sorcery component it, it's just it's kind of it's not a coincidence i think <laughs> solidarity with those people my friend yeah oh, marcus that's that's fantastic can we have another look at the hammer yeah I like this because this is like, this is the wand, you know, if the wand is a way of directing attention and power at a thing, and maybe the anvil is like you say, the altar or the, even the pentacle, the surface upon which the work is done. Mm -hmm. Of course, these everyday things. Yeah. Man, you know, yeah, totally, man. That yeah, authenticity. It's definitely, a, uh, it's definitely like in, in the context of like a wand or what have you, you know, like it, the, the force of my will and also of my my creativity my imagination um combined with the power of fire breath all the elements go into like the the use of this this hammer on a esoteric level um and to be able to move something so f typically f like considered fixed you know like iron is such a fixed thing and and to be able to move it through like the force and violence. And I think that's the thing that is such a, a, a beautiful philosophical emphasis with the use of the hammer is that we are creating beautiful utility also and also utilitarian uh, uh, objects and tools and, and things from uh, with a martial practice of, of violence, intelligent and applied violence. Uh, to accomplish beautiful ends uh, with with sheer force and determination <laughs> and, and quenched in the water yeah occasionally yeah some things can't be uh, quenched in water yeah uh -huh. yeah they have to uh, um, sometimes things have to be air cooled or sometimes they have to be uh, uh, quenched in oil which slows down the 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 cooling process so that the the crystals can can form within because steel is a crystal which is just also just kind of neat to think about and so like the what's so interesting about steel is that it's because it is fixed you know this martial element that's extraordinarily stubborn it takes fire to make it mutable and receptive and then when it becomes mutable and receptive in a semi-liquid state, then you can crystallize it. And that's where we get into like the alchemical philosophy uh, by the hardening process through its cooling, it then becomes like this crystalline form uh, that still maintains the structure of what you put it in. And so it's from an alchemical philosophical standpoint, it's just fascinating, you know, and, and, and in uh, lab alchemy, which I, you know, I study with Robert Bartlett, uh, uh, which is Frater Albertus's, you know, like torch bearer, you know, like the, uh, I learned from him the, 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 the techniques that I use in my, my work uh, with blacksmithing and in making these magical objects. And the, it's so interesting, he'll take like a super saturated solution of plant salts uh, that is in a liquid solution. And then he will, hit it or you know like agitate it and they uh become solidified and when they become solidified uh they they crystallize from a liquid solution to a uh, a, a solid crystal pattern and at that moment that the crystallization starts the astrological influences that are occurring at that time become locked within the plant st crystals and so when he demonstrated this, I mean, and I'd watched him demonstrate this like uh, several times uh, over the years, but when he demonstrated it, I just started blacksmithing and I, it just, it struck me, was like, this is why in the grimoire traditions, you quench 
during particular astrological times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you're cri you're crystallizing the steel liquid you're literally it's in a receptive mode where it can have the influences from the astrological the heavenly bodies and you're literally crystallizing those influences those astrological influences during an electional time or you know a particular period into the the steel or whatever metal you're working with i mean how how awesome is that <laughs> that that is absolutely awesome that's yeah. absolutely awesome marcus mccoy thank you so much for sharing some of your practice and oh, the practical you. depth and our chemical richness of that. It's really appreciated, my friends. That's really Thank great. You. Thank, Thank you, so you much. for having me and, and speaking with me today. It's been a good time. Yeah. Cheers, my friend. I'll see you soon. Cheers.